Stories from Father Tim Deere. Father Tim is an American priest from Chicago. In 1988, he was deeply renewed in his priesthood during a pilgrimage to Medjugorje. He has now an incredible ministry for the young, and uh, he likes to share with them concrete examples in order to let them discover the treasures of the faith. Today we are in Medjugorje. Let's sneak in the room where Father Tim is telling a bunch of young guys about two young men, two amazing lives of our generation. Brian Walsh that he personally knew from the US and also Giorgio Frassati from Italy. Oh my gosh, he's already started. And on this Easter Sunday, it's appropriate that we not just think of the of the risen Christ himself, but members of his body who have also died and risen with him. Because that's the call for all of us, that it's not just enough to look back 2,000 years ago at the historical Jesus who's risen from the tomb, but he wants us to carry our cross, to die to ourselves. And people sometimes say, well, how do you do that? How do you um, die to yourself? And is it possible for us to become saints? Um, to really do that. Because if you die to yourself and rise with Christ, you're becoming a saint. So I'm going to tell you today about two um, people that I have known who are on the road to sainthood. And the first one is an American, pardon me, because we're talking to a lot of Australians and New Zealanders and Irish and English and a few Americans thrown in. Um, and uh, two French, yes. Uh, <laughs> But um, I want to first talk to you about someone that, that I know very well. His name is Brian Walsh, W-A-L-C-H. And Brian lived in a suburb of, of Detroit, Michigan. Detroit is famous for what? Automobiles. Automobiles. It's where Henry Ford you know, lived, the inventor of the automobile. And um, they still have large car plants there. And Brian lived in a, a well-to-do middle-class home. He was given everything that um, parents usually try to give their children, besides a, a beautiful home and um, clothing. He also was given a, a nice car when he turned driving age, and uh, which is 16 in America and most states. And uh, he also was blessed with a lot of talents. He was a very good athlete. He was captain of the basketball team at the Catholic high school that he attended. He was um, a great student leader, a very good student. Um, he was very popular. He was good looking. So he attracted people to him. He had a wonderful smile and a good sense of humor. So he attracted a lot of people to himself. But Brian was also like a lot of teenagers are in all of our countries in the West. He drank. Um, and uh, drank to excess sometimes. In fact, his favorite liquor was Cuddy Sark whiskey, and he had a huge yellow and black Cuddy Sark poster on the wall in his bedroom, the way kids always put posters up. And his parents thought, I think, that uh, he appreciated the artwork because it shows one of these tall ships, tall sail ships, but he had it up there because he liked the whiskey, not because he liked the artwork. <laughs> And he got rip-roaring drunk on the weekends the way a lot of kids do. A lot of kids drink to excess. And then um, he cursed a lot. His language was terrible, but never around his parents or the priests or lay teachers in the school. And again, most teenagers are very good about walking the fine line and leading the double life so that when they're with a certain set of people, they behave beautifully. When they're with another set of people, their peers, their mates, then they use all this garbage language and they're drinking, and they're telling dirty jokes and all that. So Brian was that kind of person. Um, the priests, you know, loved him. The parents thought he was the greatest thing. The sun and moon, you know, were hung on him. And then all his friends at school knew that he was just a slob like everybody else. Um, he um, was had gotten into premarital sex, you know, things like that. And then he stunned everyone at the end of his last year of high school when he announced that he thought he would go to the seminary. You know, he stunned all his friends because they thought, you know, Brian, you know, you're not the type of person to become a priest. He stunned the teachers and the priests because they thought he was really wasting his life. You know, a lot of people think that if you become a priest, you know, you're wasting the chance to get a good job and to make something of yourself, make a lot of money. And so there wasn't a whole lot of encouragement for this. When he came to the seminary, it was the seminary where I was a student in Chicago, Illinois, and he was in the class um, one year below me. And we could not figure out how Brian got past the psychological exams um, because Brian did not change his style of living at all. When he came, 
He saw that we had very simple rooms. We just had a bed, desk, chair, crucifix on the wall, and a tile floor. No air conditioning, no TVs, nothing like this. Well, he brought in wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, put in an air conditioner, <laughs> brought in a TV, stereo system, and he brought along his Cuddy Sark whiskey. And he, well, he wasn't having sex, but he brought porno magazines, and he used to have little parties in his room. And, of course, he was very popular. Everybody was going, they couldn't believe this, you know? <laughs> You know, in the seminary, we were all 18 to 22 years old. We were all just young people, 21 maybe. And uh, even though we were studying to be priests, we weren't saints. And so I remember there was a lot of traffic going in and out of Brian's room. And uh, he would invite me to come to parties. And I didn't drink, but I would stand in the doorway and watch all this. And I thought, oh, Brian, you're not going to last. Well, he made it through the first year. And at the end of the first year, we had a retreat. And the retreat was 10 days of silence. Now imagine, again, 75, 18 to 21 year olds locked up for 10 days of silence. It was not a pretty sight. Um, we were all talking when we could and passing notes and running out in the back and doing this and that. I remember that we sat in the church and listened to this priest talk, and it just went right over my head. I cannot tell you a single thing that was said during those 10 days. But I do remember one thing that happened, and that was on the last day during Mass, the priest invited us to make spontaneous prayers of the faithful. And uh, so we were making intentions for the sick and for our families and this and that. And then Brian said, uh, Lord, I, I want to tell you that I'm really sorry that I realize I have um, wasted my talents. I've wasted the gifts you've given me. I've abused the trust my parents have put in me. I've not been the person they thought I was. I've been a great sinner, and I want to change my life and turn my life over to you. And I remember nudging the guy next to me and saying, um, oh, look now, Brian's going to... Um, He's getting religion, you know, and we were all kind of giggling in the side listening to Brian. We didn't take him seriously at all. So we went away for our, our summer holidays and we came back to school to the next year and Brian had changed. He had sold his car and given the money to the poor. He got rid of all his nice, stylish clothing. He only had two outfits of work clothes to wear, one to wear, one to wash. He gave away his TV. I didn't get that. Gave away his air conditioner. I didn't get that. Got rid of the porno magazines. I didn't get those. Um, <laughs> stopped the drinking. Stopped the cursing. And he just became a different person. He was the same person. He still had the same smile, same popularity, same sense of humor. But he was a different person. He spent a lot of time in the chapel praying. And uh, I remember going to the chapel one day to practice the organ because I was the, the seminary organist. And I was a little annoyed because Brian was in there sitting on the floor in front of the tabernacle. And I was watching at the time I wanted him to get out of there because I had to practice the organ. Imagine someone going to the chapel to pray in the middle of the day. I mean, this just wasn't done in the seminary. <laughs> so I was sitting there waiting, tapping the floor. And then finally he got up and he came out. And as he saw me, he walked over to me and he said, Tim, have you ever thought how wonderful it is that Jesus always remains with us in the most blessed sacrament? And I remember looking at him and thinking to myself, no, I've never thought this, you know. <laughs> but I believed it, but it wasn't something I was caught up in. And yet his face was on fire with love for God. And he had such a, a beautiful expression. He looked like an angel. I will never forget that moment of looking at Brian when he said that. Well, at the end of the second year, we were sent for some hands-on experience to prepare for the priesthood. And so I was sent to a school for rich boys in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is a big oil um, refinery place. Uh, and uh, I had kids who were chauffeured to school in limousines and, and these homes like out of the, the programs you see on TV with the big sweeping staircase and the father in the silk smoking jacket and the maids running around. I mean, it was, it was literally like that there. I was just overwhelmed by the wealth. Brian was put in the opposite end of the spectrum. He was put in a very poor parish in St. Louis, Missouri, which served poor whites and poor blacks who would come to the door asking for handouts. And the priests had donations um, in a pantry of tin goods, canned goods, and clothing, and they had some money they would give to the people. And there was a shelter down the street run by somebody else that they could send people for an overnight. And Brian loved it there. Oh, he just got into this. He gave away all the food, and he gave away the clothing, and of course he'd give away his own things. So when he ran out of clothing, then he would go up to the priest's bedrooms and give out clothes from their wardrobes, <laughs> pillows and blankets off their beds. 
And sometimes he would give away the, the food was being prepared for dinner that night, give a casserole away or this or that. The priest didn't know what to do because, you know, they said, and I knew all these priests, they said, Brian was doing exactly what Jesus says to do. If you want to be perfect, go sell everything you have, give the money to the poor and come follow me. You'll have treasure in heaven. So they didn't want to criticize him. But at the same time, they were getting scared. And one night, uh, a man knocked at the door after everybody had gone to bed, and Brian answered the door, and the man needed a place to stay. So instead of sending the man down to the shelter, Brian let him come into the, the presbytery, the rectory, and gave him a place to sleep on the sofa in the, in the living room. Well, during the night, one of the priests apparently woke up and came downstairs to go to the kitchen for a glass of milk or whatever. And as he walked through the, this lounge room, he must have startled the man who was sleeping on the sofa. And you know, street people are always half awake because they're afraid of getting robbed or beaten up on the street. So the man woke up, and he picked up a, a big glass ashtray was sitting on a coffee table in front of the sofa and threw it through the dark and hit the priest right in the eye and almost put his eye out, gave him a good cut. So the next day, the priest met with Brian, and they said, Brian, what you're doing is wonderful, but if you give away all of our food and all of our clothing, then we're going to be on the street one day asking for handouts, and we won't be able to help anybody else. And we just don't live this way in absolute poverty here in America. So maybe you're called to join a religious community that works exclusively with the poor. And Brian agreed with that, and he left St. Louis, and he left the United States, and he went far away to join up with a little nun who at that time was not known at all. And she was off in Calcutta, India. And that was, of course, Mother Teresa. You know, we didn't know about Mother Teresa at that time. So he joined Mother Teresa. Um, he wasn't a member of the community. He was just kind of like an observer, the way uh, many young people still have gone over to Calcutta to do some volunteer work. So he was with her, and then he was sent by her, and she has a men's group, you know, there are brothers of, of uh, charity also. And with the men's group, he went over to Vietnam, and it was right at the time the Vietnam War was ending, and he was involved in the pullout, that great evacuation of Hanoi, or not Hanoi, what was the city in the south? Saigon in the South, and uh, was sent back to Mother Teresa. And then after a period of, of rest, he was reassigned to Cambodia, which is right next to Vietnam. And Cambodia was going through the same thing that Vietnam had just finished. The communists were invading from the North. The democratic government in the South was being propped up by the Americans, the Australians, the British, the French, other allies. But then we discovered that the democratic government was really corrupt and lost heart for that fight and pulled our people out. And Brian sent us a letter right at that time that the pullout was going on, the evacuation. And I remember standing with the letter in my hand with three or four other seminarians, reading the letter out loud, and there was one line of the letter that I will always remember, and it said this, This time, if I'm asked to leave, I will stay, because I feel called to mix my blood with the blood of Christ for the salvation of these people's souls. I can remember the letter because it was printed on, obviously typed on an old typewriter. It was very faded ink, and the letters were all up and down on the page. It wasn't a nice-looking letter. But I said, this sounds like something from the lives of the saints. This doesn't sound like the Brian Walsh we know. And then I didn't think much more of it until I was back in the school in Tulsa teaching, and I picked up the newspaper one day. It was Easter time, and I picked up the newspaper, and the headline said, Phnom Penh falls to Reds. Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, and the Reds, of course, the communists. And the first line of the article said this, only two Americans remain in Phnom Penh this evening, one an aviation instructor, I don't remember the name, and the other, Brian Walsh, an American missionary. And I put the paper down and I said, I wonder what's going to happen to Brian. This was the first and only time in my life I ever read an international world headline story where I knew the person who was in it. I mean, we read the news all the time, but we don't know John Howard. We don't know Pope John Paul. We don't know Queen Elizabeth. We don't know Bill Clinton. But here, you know, this was someone I knew. And so I said, I wonder what's going to happen to Brian. And from that Easter until Christmas, I never gave it much more thought. And then at Christmas, all of us seminarians were back at the seminary for another 10-day silent retreat. And I don't remember a thing about that retreat 
except for the fact that we received a message from the American government, which was read to us during Mass one day. And in the message, it said that Brian had stayed in Cambodia against the advice of the government, but they had kept an eye on him through the CIA. You know, the American government always has native spies in all these countries. Some of you are probably CIA here. And um, <laughs> we have so many countries represented here, we probably have a whole coalition of CIA here. And um, so they had they had watched him, and it said Brian was moving from house to house so as not to you know be found. And of course, pretty hard not to find a tall blonde kid in a country of short little you know Cambodian people. But he was moving from house to house. He was trying to keep up the people's morale. He was teaching catechism, and he was going to mass every day. And they only had one church left open in Phnom Penh, which is a city of several million people, and a large percentage of the Cambodian and the Vietnamese people are Catholics. And so um, he had gone to Mass every day, but the Mass was very early in the morning, like 4 o'clock in the morning. And he would go in the darkness so he couldn't be found. But one day the communists finally had discovered his route, and they followed him into the church during Mass and arrested him took him outside the cathedral church and chopped off his head. And he was only 23 years old at the time. So the following year, Mother Teresa had come to the United States to begin a, a tour, a speaking tour of our country. And she came to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I was teaching. And I brought my students from my religion classes to the great stadium where she was speaking. And then afterwards, I went backstage to meet her. It was very easy because she wasn't well known. She hadn't won the Nobel Peace Prize and all that stuff. So I went backstage, and there she was. And I said to her mother, I'm the, the friend and classmate of someone I think you know. And she said, who is that? And I said, Brian Walsh. And her face lit up with a smile. And she said, ah, you are a very fortunate young man because you are the classmate of a saint. And five years ago, well, that's about six years ago now, I think, Mother Teresa um, began the process of of introducing the cause for the canonization of Brian Walsh as a saint and martyr of the church. And so here is someone from our own time, from our own culture, basketball, school, drinking, premarital sex, cursing and swearing, driving around in a fast car, you know, living that kind of life, which a lot of people, including a lot of Catholic young people are living, who went from the age of 18 of doing all that stuff to the age of 23, dying as a martyr, and consciously doing so, because he had said, this time I will not leave, because I feel called to mix my blood with the blood of Christ for the salvation of these people's souls. And so it is possible for us to be converted. It is possible for us to grow. It is possible for us to give our lives completely to Christ. Do we all have to die as martyrs? No. As we said before, some of us die as red martyrs, the people who die giving their lives for Christ in one moment of death. And there are others of us who are called to little by little die with Christ by making decisions every day to um, think of others first and to think of ourselves last. And so I want to tell you about one of these people and um, this person I have photographs of because he also is from our own time, relatively so. So we'll pass out these photographs and later on I'll pass out a brochure, make sure that you don't let me leave without that. And this young man's name is Pier Giorgio Frassati. Pier Giorgio um, was born in 1901 in Turin, Italy, in the northern part of Italy. And Turin, by coincidence, is also a great auto manufacturing center. It's where the Fiat Automobile um, and uh, some other um, cars of Italy are manufactured. Pier Giorgio is also from a well-to-do family like Brian, um, but even more so. His father, Alfredo Frassati, was an ambassador from Italy to Germany in the period between the two world wars. He was the youngest senator in the Kingdom of Italy at that time. He was um, also the owner, the proprietor and owner of a great newspaper which still exists called La Stampa, which means the press. When you're in Rome, you'll see the, on the newsstands La Stampa as one of the newspapers that's added there. So his father had a lot of money, um, a self-made man. His mother was um, from a great family of, of northern Italy, a very wealthy family, and they're, together they had a number of homes. Um, they had a beautiful home in Turin, and then they had a, a holiday home outside 
um, which has uh, thir- uh, that's the smallest of their homes. It's 36 rooms, um, and they Pierre Giorgio grew up in a, a life of maids and butlers and chauffeurs and gardeners and cooks and all of that. He was very well pampered. He had an older sister who died in infancy, and then a younger sister who is still alive today. She was younger by one year, and she is now 96 years old. She's still alive, still very lucid and able to tell you a lot of stories about Pier Giorgio. Well, not only was his family wealthy, but they were not religious. His father was an atheist. Um, he had nothing to do with the church except because he was a politician. He invited priests into the home to discuss the politics of the time. And his mother went to Mass, but his, um, child, her children never saw her receive Holy Communion. So she was a a Sunday Mass Catholic, but there was no devotion there. They said no prayers in the home, not even a blessing before the meals. There was no such thing as observing laws of fast and abstinence during Lent. Um, There was no holy pictures on the walls, no family rosary, none of this stuff that we think is the atmosphere necessary for creating a saint. Um, Pier Giorgio did not grow up in a, a Catholic home in that sense. He had a grandmother who prayed in her bedroom a lot, um, the way a lot of old Italian women would when, they, when they're older, they pray for their dead. But there was no overt practice of the faith going on. And yet Pier Giorgio grew to love God. Um, I remember in one of the stories, his um, tutor, a nun, was taking the two children on the street to go somewhere, and a priest came by. He was bringing communion to the dying. And in those days, especially in a Catholic country like Italy, the priest could come in all his vestments with altar boys and candles, and they'd ring a bell, and all the people would kneel on the street. And so the sister said to the two children, "Um, Our Lord is coming, passing by. Um, Let's kneel down because he is a king. And Pier Giorgio, who was only a little boy at the time, said, Yes, he is the king of kings and knelt down. Um, There's a story that um, they were at a Corpus Christi procession, a great procession in honor of of the Blessed Sacrament, and all the people came, even the non-believers, they all come, and they stand on the balconies or on the side of the street to watch, and they throw flowers. And little Pierre Giorgio, who was about four years old at the time, had no flowers to throw, and he saw the other children throwing flowers, and so he reached into the pocket of a relative and pulled out a nice gold pen and threw the gold pen out on the street and said, this is for you, Jesus. So he had a sense of, of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And as he grew up, he started going to daily Mass on his own. Um, His parents never knew. He would go early in the morning, um, sometimes in the middle of the night. When they were in the country, he would sneak out. The gardener would wake him because he had a rope tied to a um, bedside table, and the gardener would pull on the rope, and then Pierre George would wake up, although one time... Pierre George was really asleep hard, and the gardener pulled and pulled, and finally the table turned over, and the whole family woke up. They'd know what was going on. But usually Pierre George would wake up. He'd climb up a mountain, you know, like Krizhevats, you know, a very big mountain. It took me um, one time to go from his house to this church three hours on foot, and he would make it in 45 minutes in the dark go to Mass, and then come back home, kneel down and pray his rosary by his bed, sometimes fall asleep on the floor. And his father would come in, to wake him up for school and would think that Pier Giorgio had fallen asleep at night at bedtime, not realizing the boy had been out during the night to go to Mass and had come back and fallen asleep. He would go to Adoration Blessed Sacrament. Um, sometimes he would bring his friends. He would go to the pool hall, and all his friends were there, and he would say, um, all right, let's play a game of pool, and if you win, I'll pay you some money. And if I win, you come to the holy hour with me at the cathedral. <laughs> And the people in the town and the priests, they remember Pier Giorgio coming through the street with a group of young people, boys and girls, and they'd all be laughing and hollering and singing and pushing one another the way young people do on the streets. Then when they would get to the church, they would be all quiet and come in. Pier Giorgio would sit them all down, give them little prayer books to read or give them rosaries. He always carried a lot of little leaflets and rosaries with him. And then he would go up and kneel by the communion railing. And his friends would all quickly fall asleep. They'd be bored and they'd just fall asleep. Pier Giorgio, the priest and people remember, would kneel completely transfixed before the Blessed Sacrament to the point where one time some nearby candles were melting on Pier Giorgio and a priest went up to move the candles and saw the Pier Giorgio wasn't even bothered by this at all. He was so focused on the Blessed Sacrament. And then he would get up at the end of the hour and wake up all his friends and take them out, and they'd all go chasing each other home. So he was very normal. Um, He was also a good-looking boy, as you see in the picture. Um, He was a great athlete. Um, He was a championship skier, mountain climber, swimmer. Um, He rode horseback, um, did all sorts of sports. He drove a car. 
did all these normal things. He went to parties with his friends. We have photographs of him with his friends, and he has a stupid party hat on. He has a bottle of wine in his hand. But his friends said they never saw him get drunk. In fact, they never saw him drink more than a glass of wine, just one. They never heard him cursing. Um, they never, you know, saw him get become a party to a dirty joke. Um, that he was one of them, but he was separate from them. When they would go on a weekend skiing or mountain climbing trip, he would make sure it was near a church. And if it wasn't, then he would pay to have a priest come out on the train to say Mass for them. And we have many photographs of the outdoor Masses they had. And if he couldn't get a priest, then he wouldn't go on the trip. His friends remember going on the train to, you know, go to skiing, and they would be up during the night in their little train car with six of them together, passing around snacks and a bottle to drink and having a good time. And Pierre Giorgio would always say no to the refreshments. And then the next morning, they would go to the church for Mass, and he would be the only one to go to communion, because in those days you had to fast from midnight on. And he was the only one who would remember to fast. In fact, most of the kids de didn't even go to Mass. And later on they said, our parents couldn't get us to go to church. Our priests couldn't convince us to go to church. But Pier Giorgio brought us to church. When they would go to the mountains and they would get to the top, he'd say, well, since we're resting here, let's all pray a rosary. Or he would pull out a little prayer book and say, let's all say a few psalms. And so he led them in prayer. And they said he never did it in a, in a nagging way, but it was always just something by the power of his character, by the leadership of his, his personality, he was able to get them to pray. He also loved the poor. From his earliest years, he had a sense of the needs of the poor. Of course, be, being from a rich family in a big home in Turin, a lot of poor people would come to the door. And the maids and butlers would turn these people away because they were so frequently coming. And Pier Giorgio, from when he was four or five years old, would you know get angry at the house staff, and he would run after these poor people and bring them back and order the staff to find them something to eat or say, well, just wait here and I'll tell my father he'll find you a job. Um, my mother will give you some money. And so he was very into this. When he started going to school on his own, his father would give him money for the tram or the bus. And he would pocket the money and save it up and ride his bike to school instead. And then he would buy loaves of day-old Italian bread with his money and go through the poor sections of the city and give out the bread to children. And as he got older and had more money available, he did more and more. In fact, when his father gave him a car on his 18th birthday, I think it was, um, he sold it that day and gave half the money to the St. Vincent de Paul Society, of which he was a member, and the other half he distributed to families that he knew. By the time he was 21, Pier Giorgio was supporting over 125 families by himself, paying for rent, food, clothing, tuition for children. He made sure the children received the sacraments. He was the sponsor for these children, bought them clothing to wear for baptism and first communion and confirmation, and would also go and sit in the homes and encourage the families to go to church if the parents weren't attending Mass. But he did it all anonymously because he was a very famous young man. He was sort of like the John Kennedy Jr. of his day because his father owned a newspaper and he could always print it, something about Pier Giorgio. Pier Giorgio was a great leader in Italy of young people who were opposed to Mussolini and the fascist movement. And he led demonstrations in Rome, in Ravenna, in Turin, in Milan, and other places where you had tens of thousands of young people following Pier Giorgio Frassati. So he was very politically involved. He just wasn't a goody-goody that went to Mass in the morning and, and and then played around and did his little rich thing going for skiing holidays on the weekend and all that. He was, you know, very aware of the needs of, of his country and so was, was publicly involved. And therefore, when he went to visit the poor, he did not tell them his name was Frassati because even today the Frassatis are one of the three most important families in Italy. He would tell them his name was Brother Jerome because when he joined another group, he joined about 15 different Catholic organizations, Apostleship of Prayer, Sodality of Our Lady, um, the St. Vincent de Paul Society, um, the Rosary Confraternity, the Eucharistic Adoration League, and he was also in the lay Dominicans, the Third Order Dominican lay people. And so he took the name Brother Jerome. And so we tell the people, my name is Brother Jerome, and they never knew who their patron was. But we have several volumes of testimonies from people afterwards who tell about how good Pier Giorgio was to them. And whatever they needed, he would supply. Of course, he didn't have all the money himself. He borrowed money from his sister, from his friends, and he kept very good accounts of all the money he spent and all the money he owed. So we see every day the money he spent for bread, for groceries, for rent. He did have one little vice. He liked to 
smoke these little small Tom cigars, Tuscan cigars. And so we see that also on his ledger, that he would have Toscani, you know, little Tuscan cigars. And we have photographs of Pier Giorgio smoking his little cigars, too. Well, um, his parents were not getting along at all. Um, they were very distant. His mother was a very submissive and withdrawn type of person. She was a painter, and she spent more and more time in her attic studio painting. Um, the father was big involved in politics and very outgoing, and they were drifting apart. And mealtime became very difficult in the family because there was no speaking at all unless the father was throwing some kind of a tantrum about something. And eventually the parents announced they were going to divorce. And this just crushed Pierre Giorgio, and especially was at a time when divorce was almost unheard of. So he said to one of his friends one day, I would gladly give my life if my parents would stay together. So he said to one of his friends one day, I would gladly give my life if my parents would stay together. Uh, he went mountain climbing that second week of June. I think it was June the 13th, 1925. And he had a beautiful picture taken by a friend of him near the top of this mountain. And so he wrote on the back of the picture, Verso l'Alto, which means toward the top. And that was his last mountain climb. And that little expression he used was almost prophetic um, because within a few weeks he had visited a poor person um, who was sick with polio. And Pier Giorgio caught the polio. And in those days, there was no vaccine against it. And there was no, there was no way to cure it once you had it. And Pier Giorgio, for the first time in his life, experienced some you know, pain to the point where he asked a maid for an aspirin tablet. And so it was the first time he ever asked for any kind of medication. So the maid knew that he was sick. But at the same time, his grandmother died. And so the whole family was caught up in the wake and the funeral for the grandmother. And they didn't even notice that Pier Giorgio was staggering down the hallway to visit his grandmother's body in the bedroom, that he collapsed three times on the way down the hall, that he was moving around from room to room. He slept on the pool table one night because the bed wasn't hard enough. And um, even the last photograph they took of him, he has a very strained expression on his face. They did not realize he was really sick until two days before he died. And then they went into a panic. They tried to send to France for a vaccine, but there was a snowstorm in the mountains and then no plane could get through. And so they had to resign themselves to his death. The night before he died, he was in his bed and he asked his sister to go to his wardrobe and get his jacket because in his jacket pocket was a, a prescription that he had. And he asked to write a note. Well, he could hardly write because his body was paralyzed. But, and his sister offered to write the note, but he insisted on doing it himself. He said, this is my responsibility. And he wrote the note, which we still have, and he gave it to his sister for a friend. It says, um, here are the injections for the poor man Converso. Apparently he also had some, some syringe injections for this man's medicine. He said, here are the injections for the poor man Converso. Um, the receipt for the injections belongs to another friend, Sapia. He said, please renew the prescription and charge it to my account at the pharmacy. The last thing he did was thinking of someone else's need. Um, and then on the next day, which was holy... Um, it wasn't Holy Saturday, it was um, July the, the 4th, 1925. He died um, in a lot of pain and agony. When he died and they had the funeral, 10,000 people came. Of course, there was the usual family and friends, but also his university friends told about his death throughout the school. 500 kids came. Um, he had just finished a degree in engineering. And um, I should mention here that Pier Giorgio, of course, was a layman. He was not a priest. He thought of becoming a priest, but his mother said, I'd rather see you dead. Um, he thought of getting married, and he brought a girlfriend of his to his home, and his parents received her very politely, but afterwards they said, you can't marry her because she's too poor for you. He thought of being a lay missionary among Italian immigrants in Germany or in America, and that's why he was getting a degree in engineering, so he could work in the mines among the poorest of the people. His father said, no son of mine is going to dirty himself working with the poor. You're going to work in the newspaper with the family. And so he was thwarted in what he wanted to do with his life. He had not found his life's vocation yet, but that didn't deter him from doing something with his life. So many young people feel that until they get married or until they get a steady job, that they have a right 
to just waste time. They have a right to go out and stay out late every night, go to parties. They have a right to their parents' money to go drinking and to smoke and to do drugs and to run around and just have a great old time. And their parents will always support them. They never have to worry about this. We have a lot of young people like that who have no purpose in life. And Pierre Giorgio didn't live like that. He found a purpose in his life, serving the poor and the sick and um, um, loving our Lord and going to prayers. So all these people came to the funeral, and his parents were so stunned that they stayed together, and they converted their lives, and um, they worked then for the canonization of their son, which was thwarted then. Five years after Pier Giorgio died, which is the normal length of time, they began the process of canonization, but Mussolini stopped it. He put pressure on priests in the church, cardinals in the church, to not have this canonization because the Frassati family was opposed to the fascists. The father had also published articles against Mussolini, had resigned as ambassador, resigned as senator, and Mussolini took away from them their, their nice home in the city and made it an office building, took away the newspaper business and sold it at a cheap price to another family, the now owns of the Agnelli family and their masons, and so tried to reduce the Frassatis to poverty. It didn't work. The father was offered a job later on working with the Italian gas company. But they stopped the canonization process. They spread rumors that Pier Giorgio was not such a good and holy boy after all, that he was having a lot of premarital sexual affairs, and that the parents had not, um, that the boy had not died, that the parents had buried him alive because they were embarrassed that their boy was becoming a cripple and didn't want to raise an invalid. So nothing was done on the cause for a number of years. And finally... Um, Pope Paul VI came along. And Pope Paul VI, when he was a young priest, had become the chaplain of the youth group that Pier Giorgio belonged to. So he ordered the cause to be opened. And for seven or eight years, he was waiting for the cause to be finished. The cause means all the paperwork, the investigation, the interviews that have to go on to find out you know, about this person's life. And after seven or eight years, nothing had happened. And Pier Gio or the Pope Paul VI found out that these cardinals and bishops had still given in to the forces in Italian politics that didn't want this boy canonized. So the Holy Father was angry. Some people said it was the only time they ever saw him angry. And he pounded on desk and he said, bring the papers to me. I will open the cause myself. And so he started it. And then Pope Paul, John Paul II came along. And Pope John Paul II is a mountain climber and a skier when he was a younger man. And when he was a young boy, he had read about Pier Giorgio in a mountain climbing magazine for young Catholic students and had been inspired by the story. Um, just as I hope you'll be inspired, I'll give you some more information. And he had developed a great love for Pier Giorgio. So he completed the cause, and he's the one who beatified Pier Giorgio. And as you'll see in, when you receive the brochure, they have a beautiful photograph of the beatification in St. Peter's Square. And usually when saints are canonized or beatified, because it's a costly ceremony and all of that, they'll usually do several saints at once and have a group mass. Even when Blessed Faustina was beatified, she was along with five or six other saints. But the Holy Father gave Pier Giorgio the privilege of having his own ceremony because he said, Pier Giorgio became holy without the help of his family, without the help of being in a seminary, without the help of being in a religious order. He did it all by himself with his own response to God. He did it quietly, he did it anonymously, and yet he touched thousands of lives. And um, so now we're waiting on one more miracle. There was a miracle worked um, shortly after Pier Giorgio's death. There was a, a man who had been an atheist all his life and didn't believe at all, and he was dying, and the doctor said he would be dead before morning. And his wife said, oh, please let me call for a priest so you can reconcile yourself to the church. And he said, no, I never want to see a priest. Don't bring a priest here at all. And the lady had a holy card with a little piece of the of the bed sheet from Pier Giorgio's deathbed. And she said, well, let me put this on you and say this prayer. Please let me do this. And he said, well, I suppose it won't hurt. So she put the, the relic on him. There are no relics of Pier Giorgio's body. I'll tell you why in a moment. But she put the relic card on him and then prayed the prayer. And immediately the man was well and went got dressed and went down to the parish church in the middle of the night, banged on the door and woke up the parish priest, made his confession.
and was reconciled to the church. And so that was the miracle for the beatification. Now we're waiting for a miracle for the canonization. We have a number of people who are proposing uh, ideas of miracles. Well, part of the process of a, of a beatification is to exhume or to take out of the grave the body of the proposed saint so that if they're going to have a saint, they'll have a place where the people can come and pray. And also they'll take relics. The bodies decompose and they take bits and pieces and have relics. We don't understand relics sometimes, but it's very understandable because a lot of you mothers have kept the first tooth lost by your children or a curl of hair from your child's first haircut. And what it is, it's dead pieces of body lying in your drawer in a little box when you think about it. But it's something sentimental to you, right? And so for us in the church, it makes no sense to outsiders, but we have these little pieces of body lying around in our churches, and it's a sentimental attachment to these people who once lived on this earth. So they took Pier Giorgio's body out of the ground 54 years after his death, and they opened up the casket. It was raining that day. They didn't expect to find anything, so they weren't worried about protecting the body. They opened up the casket in the presence of his sister and his sister's children and priests and doctors, and when they opened up the lid, there was Pier Giorgio, so perfectly intact, he looked like he was asleep, his skin elastic, his eyes had opened, and they were clear and shining, and usually the eyes are the first thing that deteriorate. They knew that the elements had gotten to his body because his clothing was all wet, his crucifix was on his chest, the wood had rotted, and then the body of Jesus on it was rusted, his rosary had fallen apart but his body was completely intact. And the Italians, well, they loved this. They were so excited. They took Pier Giorgio on a tour, you know, to the places where he had been <laughs> so that people could see him and touch him, you know. And now his body is in the cathedral in Turin in the same church where the Shroud of Turin is. Um, and the Holy Father wants Pier Giorgio to be especially a patron for young people um, of our day. And if you look at the picture of him, he's, he's dressed in an ordinary shirt like young boys would wear today. Um, and he did all the things young people do. Um, and Holy Father calls him the man of the eight Beatitudes because he perfectly expressed in his life the eight Beatitudes of Jesus, which are Jesus' guidelines to holiness. So I tell you these two stories to show you, especially you young people, some of you have committed a lot of sins and some serious sins, and you still can become saints. God still wants you to be saints. Some of you have not gotten into serious trouble. And God wants you to continue in that and become saints. But either way, God has a plan for all of us to become saints. And if we don't think we're going to become saints, that means we're not going to heaven. Because the only people in heaven are saints. There are no imperfect people in heaven. And if we're not going to go through some kind of sacrifice and dying to ourselves and suffering here on earth, then we'll have to do it in purgatory for a long time because that's where we're purified of our selfishness and our selflessness. You know, the other day we were talking about, about riches, and um, Maxine made the comment, well, someone has to pay taxes, you know. And I think we have a misunderstanding of what Jesus means when he loves the poor and says we should be poor. It doesn't mean we should all live in poverty. We can't all do what Brian Walsh did and go live in Cambodia or Vietnam among the poor. And it doesn't necessarily mean either that we, we give away huge amounts of money like selling a brand new car as Pier Giorgio did. Those dramatic gestures are often reserved for a few people. But we can do what Pier Giorgio did or what Brian Walsh did in everyday things. We all have food that we can give away to the poor. And we sometimes, when we're asked to give food away to the poor, we give the food that we don't want to eat anyhow the canned goods of something or other that we just haven't touched and has been sitting in the back of our pantry for three years, and we give that away. But why don't we go out and buy some really good food and give that away to the poor just once a year? Or, you know, go through our wardrobes and our closets and pull out some of the clothes we know we're never going to wear again. We sometimes hang on to these things thinking we're going to lose weight or these things are going to come back into style. And our closets are jam-packed of these clothes and someone else could be using them. When we die, someone's going to go through. And you know what's going to happen? A lot of that stuff's going to be wasted. It's just going to be tossed or given to the wrong people. So we might as well take charge of our earthly things now. And, you know, we need to invite one another to prayer like Pier Giorgio did, especially young people inviting other young people to come to Mass with them, to go to confession with them, 
A lot of young people never go to confession because they don't know when it is and how it's done. But if someone says, oh, I'm going to confession on Saturday afternoon, you want to come with me? You know, if Pier Giorgio could do it, other people could do it also. But we're all called to become holy, and we have to help one another like a big human chain to come up to heaven, to little by little die to ourselves and to rise with the risen Christ. The end. <laughs> Thank you, Father. That was great. Okay, we'll pass these out. Also, you know, a little bit more. You know, a few of them. You know, for the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, to, he doesn't, God doesn't mean to be physically poor. It means to be generous and to be aware of everything God has given us. So he says, every day I love the mountains more and more, and if my studies allowed me, I should spend entire days in the mountains contemplating in that pure air the greatness of the Creator. See, if we're not poor in spirit, we have to be entertained by television and video games and computer games and all that other stuff when God has made a world for us. The world that he made for Adam and Eve belongs to us. And so Pierre Giorgio loved to go into the mountains, and that was his entertainment, his recreation. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Our life, in order to be Christian, has to be a continual renunciation, a continual sacrifice. However, this is not difficult if one thinks, what are these few years passed in suffering compared with eternal happiness, where joy will have no measure or end, where we shall have unimaginable peace? You know, he knew that even though he had to go through suffering, the suffering of his family and their family problems and the lack of religious life, that still he could offer that up. He never, you know, attacked his family, never told them you should be praying, you should be doing this, you should be taking care of the poor. He simply did it himself in silence. L lovely little story about Pier Giorgio. Um, they never said grace, as I told you, never had a blessing before meals. Did Pier Giorgio give in to that? No. Did he make a scene about it? No. His sister says, we would hear him come in. He was always late for dinner, which made my father very angry. We would all sit there waiting for Pier Giorgio. He would run upstairs. We knew he was changing his shirt because he, he was always sweaty from riding his bike all over town. Then you'd hear him slide down the banister and his feet would hit the floor. You'd hear him walking toward the dining room. Then he would stop. Then you'd hear him come in. When he stopped, he was outside the dining room saying his grace. He didn't do it in front of his family to shame them, but he didn't omit doing it. And so he had a clever way of keeping his own integrity. And a lot of us, when we're faced with situations like that, we will omit praying. We will, if sometimes we even have people visit us on the weekend, and we will not go to Mass on Sunday so as not to embarrass them. We make bad decisions like that. Pier Giorgio knew how to cleverly keep his own religious integrity without embarrassing other people. Um, let's see, what's... Ah, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. At the top he says, what wealth to be in good health as we are. But we have the duty of putting our health at the service of those who do not have it. To act otherwise would be to betray that gift of God. And so Pier Giorgio every day visited the poor after school, every single day. But because Fridays were a day of penance, he said, well, I'll do something extra on Fridays. On Fridays, he would visit the sick. He would go to their homes, bathe them, run errands for them, give them medicines, read the newspaper, read the Bible to them. He would go to the hospitals. He walked hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles every year just visiting the poor and the sick. Yeah. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. All around the sick and all around the poor, I see a special light which we do not have. So he was very well aware of the fact that riches can keep us from being holy. One time a friend asked him, how can you stand, how can you tolerate going to the homes of those poor people? They're disgusting, they're filthy, they're smelly. How can you stand that? And he said this line, which is the second one here. Jesus comes to me every morning in Holy Communion, and I repay him in my very small way by visiting the poor. Then the next one, Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. 
And in a, a, a society and a generation of our own, too, where we think that, that pleasure means having a lot of money, a lot of material things, a lot of sexual relationships, a lot of food, a lot of this and that. Pier Giorgio says, true happiness, dear friends, does not consist in the pleasures of the world or in earthly things, but in peace of conscience, which we only have if we are pure in heart and mind. But Pier Giorgio was human like all of us, and he had to struggle with this. And so he asked one of his friends in a letter, I beg you to pray for me a little, so that God may give me an iron will that does not bend and does not fail in his projects. Then we have, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And again, he writes at the end of one of his letters to a friend, My best wishes are rather one wish only, but I believe it is the only one that can be made by a true friend to a dear friend. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. For if you possess peace every day, you will be truly rich. And then the last one we hear from a boy who really loved his country and was very sad that Mussolini was taking over, that the church was being persecuted, that the people were losing their faith and their enthusiasm for Mussolini. And he was doing something about it. He wasn't just complaining at night about politics. So this beatitude, blessed are they that are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He writes, to live without faith without a patrimony to defend, without a steady struggle for truth, that is not living, but merely existing. So it's a beautiful, beautiful young man. And we read on the front of this brochure our last comment from the Holy Father about Pier Giorgio. It says, Behold the man of the eight Beatitudes who bears in himself the grace of the gospel, the good news, the joy of salvation offered to us by Christ. By his example, Pier Giorgio proclaims that a life lived in Christ's spirit, the spirit of the Beatitudes, is blessed, and that only the person who becomes a man or woman of the Beatitudes can succeed in communicating love and peace to others. Pier Giorgio repeats that it really is worth giving up everything to serve the Lord. He testifies that holiness is possible for everyone, and that only the revolution of charity can enkindle the hope of a better future in the hearts of people. So beautiful, you know, young man and two people, Pierre Giorgio, I feel like I know personally, Brian Walsh, I did know personally, but I think there's hope for all of us to become real saints in our own time. We don't have to wear long white robes and have palm branches in our hands. We can be in mountain climbing gear with a pipe in our mouth like Pierre Giorgio and still become a saint. And I hope that some of you young people especially having listened to Sister Emmanuel the other night and listening to these stories today, will realize that one of the reasons you came to Medjugorje was to hear the call to holiness, the call to sanctity, the call to sainthood, and that you have been invited here. Of all the young people that you know back home, you are the ones who were brought here by Our Lady so that you can go home and be her missionaries to bring other young people to her son, to lead people away from all the things in the world that are distracting them from God and even drawing them away from God, and to say, well, let's pray. Let's go to visit the church. Let's get together and talk about something good. Let's go out and have a good time. Let's go climb a mountain. Let's go have fun. Let's go to the beach, whatever. But let's not forget the God who made it all for us. And you'd be surprised, you know, the parents can't convert the kids, the priests can't convert the kids, but the kids will convert the kids. That's why it's good that a Medjugorje lady calls so many young people here, not to be tourists, but to be pilgrims and then to be missionaries. Okay. Uh, you didn't mention much the shock that the parents had when they discovered all those people at the funerals that appeared to them thousands of people and they discovered the second life, I mean the double life of their son. This is the thing, Pierre Giorgio's family, his sister knew everything he was doing. His sister knew it all, but never said anything. She knew it would get the father upset. And the mother knew Pierre Giorgio was wanted to go to Mass at the beginning when he was a young boy, because in those days daily Mass and communion were, were frowned upon. She was afraid he would develop a um, a lack of respect for the Eucharist. It wasn't that they didn't believe, it was just the people were different in those days. But they never realized later on he was going to daily Mass and communion, that he was going to Holy Hour, sometimes whole nights spent in adoration, confession every week. Um, his best friends were the priests. He loved hanging around priests. And everywhere he went, there were priests who knew him. 
Um, but uh, they never knew he had that kind of life. He was always late. He did not do well in school. He was average and below average. In fact, he, two years in a row, he failed classes. Um, he was always laughing in the classroom, always joking. Um, they said he was the first one to start laughing and always the last one to stop, <laughs> so that he was annoying to the teachers at times. Um, great practical joke player. Um, the one always organizing all the parties and the outings. And his friends said after he died, we never realized he was a saint when he was with us. But the moment he died, we knew. And Father, yeah. how do you explain that out of the blue he became so devoted in a, such a, a contrary circumstances? Well, no one, this is one of the great questions about Pierre Giorgio because we can't figure out how he developed a prayer life that he did or how he developed a love for the poor that he did. Um, his family, they would give leftover food to the poor at times. There's a story that his grandfather brought a donation of food to an orphanage and Pierre Giorgio came along with. He was four years old. We even have a photograph of the event. And the grandfather was standing in the doorway of the dining room talking to the sister in charge. And all the children in the orphanage were eating their lunch, which was a bowl of, of soup. And one little boy was sitting all by himself in another part of the dining room. And Pierre Giorgio right away toddled over and sat down. And the grandfather and the sister walked up because the little boy by himself had a skin disease and the sister was keeping him segregated from the others. But they heard Pier Giorgio say, well, if no one else will sit with you, I'll sit with you and I'll share your lunch. One spoonful for you and one spoonful for me, you know? <laughs> you know? But he had a great sensitivity to people's feelings, see? Even at the age of four, a great sensitivity to people's feelings. And this is something that, that I find in our society, that people don't care if they hurt other people's feelings. You're just supposed to bear up with that, you know, and be tough about it. But, um, you know, we're becoming a very hardened people in many ways. Pierre Giorgio was a very sensitive, very, very lovely boy in that. He loved flowers. He loved music. He loved art. He loved to sing. He had a terrible voice. His friends used to make him stand in the back of the church because they're so embarrassed. Sometimes they said, on the bus, he would go by church, he would just start singing. And they would all say, shut up, Pierre Giorgio, you sound awful. When he rode his horse through the village um, of Polone, where some of us will be going, he had the horse trains so that every time it passed the church, it would stop and bow its head to the ground and honor the Blessed Sacrament. Whenever Pierre Giorgio made the sign of the cross, his friends said it was never this little thing. It was always a slow and deliberate and large sign of the cross. He was never ashamed of his faith, even though at that time in Italy, the church was being persecuted, priests were being beat up on the streets. To practice the faith was considered very old-fashioned and out of date. Um, Pier Giorgio was young, vibrant, strong, politically involved, popular, handsome, rich, and Catholic. Catholic to the core. When they were climbing the mountains, if someone wasn't able to keep up, and he was the strongest of all, he would pretend that, you know, he had, you know, stepped on something and twisted his ankle, and he would lag back to be with the last one, to walk with the last person. Or if someone was, wasn't able to carry their, their, their bags or whatever, their backpack, he would carry it for them. Um, he was never one to poke fun at the others for not being able to keep up. Um, if they couldn't afford a room with heat, which some of them did because he was in a, he went to university with all different classes of kids. He would always take the poorest room and give his room with the heat to someone else. And his mother one time, she'd heard about this, and she said, is that true? And he said, well, you know, the peer, people were cold. And she said, well, I don't know why I bother to give you money to, to go travel, you know, first class and, and to have all these things. You're going to waste it on giving it to somebody else. And he said, well, it's not wasted if it's given to somebody else because it's given to Jesus. When we read Pier Giorgio's letters, of which there are hundreds, um, it's a wonderful thing to see how he opened up his heart to everybody, his family, his friends, his priests. He just poured out his heart to these people. So when he died, all this documentation came in. The letters, the postcards, the photographs. We have thousands of photographs of Pier Giorgio from the day of his birth to his funeral. We have a photograph of his body in the casket when it's exhumed, you know. But we have his entire life. We even have the photograph of the priest bringing him Holy Communion when he was dying. The family was nuts about photographs. They photographed everything. He is the only saint we have pictures of on the beach in swimming trunks, you know. <laughs> oh, when he was beatified, the headline of one of the newspapers in Rome had his photograph, and the headline said, the most beautiful saint in heaven, you know. <laughs> Let's move. 
bude svi, o da mi vjerujemo da si s nami.